Thank all of you very much. I thought they were going to sit on the front row, Brady. <laughs> Lindsay, you're not going to be responsible. I thought you and Tiffany, I thought you and Tiffany wanted them all for the rest of the day. We've almost got our stuff organized here. Palm Sunday is a day of celebration, a day of joy, a day of anticipation. Finally, the Messiah has come into town. He is here and he is going to put everything right. Finally, these Roman thugs are going to get what they deserved and they're going to be out of our country and this is going to be the kingdom of God we always wanted it to be. That's the mood on Sunday. Flannery O'Connor wrote a short story called Displaced Person. It is a story of a southern widow who just prior to World War II inherited a farm from her husband who was the district judge of the time. What she didn't know before he died was that he was using all of his income as a district judge to fund this southern farm. And it was barely hanging on. And she made it work during World War II and after the war she's working mostly the descendants of slaves and a few untrained illiterate white people. The priest comes to her one day and he says the church has had the opportunity to rescue some displaced people from Europe. These people have been put out of their homes and out of their countries by the war and we have a chance to bring them to America and put them to work. Would you help us? She thought about it a while and she flipped through the newspapers and she saw pictures of bodies piled in the street on top of one another like common trash. She read of the atrocities of the Germans against the Jews and this persistent priest kept coming back and saying, would you help us? These are Polish Jews and they need somewhere to go. So finally, not knowing how she'd make ends meet, she relented and she agreed to take one family, a husband, a wife, and two daughters. When they showed up on her southern farm, they couldn't speak a word of English. He couldn't speak English, but he could talk tractor and he could talk plow and he knew how to fix anything and pretty soon that farm was running like a top he was a perpetual motion machine she had never seen a farmhand like him anywhere in the world one day she drove in her car up to the top of a hill and she's looking out over a field of cane six or seven foot tall she watches him hook up the insulage cutter to the tractor make a few adjustments and then fire that tractor up and the smoke rise into the air. A little slower and working a little at a little different pace was on one of the farm hands, one of the former slave, descendants of slaves hooking up the trailer to the insulage cutter. He didn't talk much English but they learned hand signals and before long it was all hooked up in a row and the signals were made and he pulled into that field and he pulled into that field with that tractor and that insulage cutter and it began to sing as it moved across. He had an ability to drive that tractor through that field at just the right, space, right speed to agree with that cutter and he was cutting that cane and blowing it into the trailer at a rate she had never witnessed before. And she stood on that hill so proud of herself, she thought to herself, this guy, he may just save this farm. He may be the savior I've been looking for. That's the tone on Sunday. As she stood on the hill watching that tractor and that cutter go back and forth, it dawned on her. When word gets out what kind of worker he is, my neighbors are going to try to hire him away. I'm going to have to figure out a way to pay him more. And she wasn't the only one thinking those kind of things. There were other farm workers who were thinking to themselves, this guy's making us look bad. 
This guy is humiliating us. He goes around here silent, quiet, smiling, just doing his job and doing it three times faster than any of us do our jobs. He's making us look bad. She's thinking, wonder who I need to let go so I can pay him more so he'll keep working for me. Well, one morning she gets up and the dairy barn is quiet. The man who's been running the dairy barn has loaded his two daughters, his wife, into the car and they have driven off in the pre-dawn hours because he's going to get out of there before he's fired. So she calls the displaced person down. She calls him down. She said to him, can you milk the cows? And he jumps to action and before you know it, the cows are milked and the barn is clean, spick and span by 9.30. It had never been finished before noon before. This guy is amazing. But one day while she's going about her business, the thought flashes through her mind. You know, he ought to work for me no matter what I pay. After all, I'm the one who gave him his first job. He ought to work for me no matter what it is. She's walking through town one day and she hears a man who's raised his voice just for her benefit say, I fought in that war and I fought over there and she brings that displaced person over here to take an American job. He ought to be home. He shouldn't be working on an Alabama farm. She stores that back in her memory bank. She begins to hear more and more murmurings And she convinces herself that this man is out to get her. And she and the priest have an argument one day that I'm doing him a favor, letting him be here, and he should never expect more pay from me. So one day after visiting with a priest, she goes down to the barn to let him know where exactly where he stands. She marches down there and she folds her arms and she says, all of you people are extras. I've got bills to pay. Well, he's been there almost a year. He says, me too, much bills, little money. You're extras. I'm doing all of you a favor, she says. She takes a napkin out of her pocket. She wipes her mouth and she walks back to the house thinking to herself, now he knows he's on thin ice. Well, he just turns on the hose and continues cleaning the barn. These ideas of resentment build up over her. You know, he hasn't changed. He is still saving her farm. But her ideas and attitude towards him have changed. She goes out one morning and she says to herself, okay, today I'm going to let him go. I'm going to give him 30 days notice and that'll give him enough time to get everything plowed before he leaves. She walks down to the barn the tractors are idling there's frost on the ground he has crawled up under a tractor and he's making adjustments on the something and the brake slips on a tractor just down the way and she sees it coming she sees it start rolling toward him so do two more farm hands she sees it moving toward him And she doesn't shout, she doesn't warn him, she doesn't rescue him, she just lets that tractor roll. I'll save you the details of Flannery O'Connor's story. But after his death, the priest comes to visit with the lady again and he's trying to console her that Jesus will one day make everything right and she says to him Jesus is just another displaced person as far as I'm concerned do you see the difference between a Sunday attitude and a Thursday attitude Jesus has come into Jerusalem riding on the back of a colt and they have been praising his name and shouting hallelujahs because he is going to save them. And he never changes throughout the week. But the attitudes toward him change. They soften. They are less committed. 
they are not so certain things are changing just before Jesus rides into town on that colt the passage that Joel and read to you he is in the home of Simon the leper when a woman comes in and breaks a jar of fine an alabaster jar filled with nard Nard is a root grown at high altitudes which would, when processed and turned into an ointment has amazing medicinal powers is claimed. She comes in, breaks it and anoints his head, pours that fine oil on his head and it begins to flow down his hair and drip onto his shoulders. And Mark says, they said she shouldn't have done that. John says it's Judas, but Mark uses that they said. You know, we always wonder who they is. They, they were bound, they've been around a long time. They said, you shouldn't have done that. We should have taken that and sold it and given the money to the poor. And Jesus says, the poor you will have with you always, but you will not have me always. She is preparing me for my burial, he says. and they let it go and then on Thursday night we find Jesus gathered in a room they didn't know it was the last supper but it would be the last supper gathered with his disciples those in whom he has invested his life whom he has blessed who he has protected who he has nurtured who he has poured out the contents of the kingdom of God into their hearts and there is one at this table who has decided I don't like the way this is working out he's not aggressive enough he's not pushing enough we're not gathering weapons and so he went to the high priest and he made a deal he said I'll give him to you Sunday he's the savior by Thursday, one of his own is willing to sell him for 30 pieces of Tyranian silver. Tyranian shekels. Remember we talked about those a few weeks ago. They're 94% pure silver. For 30 of those, you can have the Messiah. Jesus knew all this. He said, the one who's going to betray me is dipping bread in the very bowl that we're all sharing now and he went on his way there's a lot of difference between Sunday and Thursday and the one thing that stays the same is that Jesus still loves God and he's still serving God's people even when their attitudes are changing we gather around this table today to remember that we are fickle sinners swayed by the thoughts that are in the wind taking Jesus' body and his blood that was given for us. Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, as we prepare to take this supper of remembrance, I ask, Lord, that you bring to mind all the times when we've wondered if your promises were true. Father, bring to the front of our thoughts all the times when we've questioned whether you might be the Savior. Lord, bring to the front of our minds all the times that we have been less than faithful. And in that remembrance and repentance, we thankfully give you praise that you have been steady when we haven't been. You've been full of love when we've been full of questions. You've been full of grace when we've been full of judgment. Father, in this holy moment of remembrance, 
remind us again of who we are and how much you love us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Reading the story of the Passion from Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of the message. And Peter blurted out, even if everyone else is ashamed of you when things fall apart, I won't be. Jesus said, oh, don't be so sure. Today, this very night, in fact, before the rooster crows twice, you'll deny me three times. He blustered in protest, even if I have to die with you, I'll never deny you. And all the others said the same thing. They came to an area called Gethsemane and Jesus told his disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James and John with him and he plunged into a sinkhole of dreadful agony. He told them, I feel bad enough right now to die. Stay here and keep vigil with me. Going a little ahead, he fell to the ground and he prayed for a way out. He said, Father, you can, can't you? Get me out of this. Take this cup away from me, but please, not what I want, but what you want. And he came back and he found them sound asleep. And he said to Peter, Simon, you went to sleep on me. Can't you stick with me a single hour? Stay alert, be in prayer so that you don't enter the danger zone without even knowing it. Don't be naive. Part of you is eager for anything in God, but another part of you is as lazy as an old dog sleeping by the fire. He then went back and prayed the same prayer. Returning, he again found them sound asleep. They simply couldn't keep their eyes open and they didn't have a plausible excuse. He came back a third time and said, are you going to sleep all night? No, you slept long enough. Time's up. The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up and let's get going. My betrayer has arrived. No sooner were the words out of his mouth when Judas, the one of the twelve, showed up with a gang of ruffians sent by the high priest, the religious scholars and leaders, bandishing swords and clubs. The betrayer had worked out a signal with them. The one I kiss, that's the one. Seize him. Make sure he doesn't get away. He went straight to Jesus and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The others then grabbed him and roughed him up. One of the men standing there unsheathed his sword, swung and came down on the chief priest's servant, lopping off the man's ear. Jesus said to them, what is this coming after me with swords and clubs as if I were a criminal? Day after day, I've been sitting in the temple teaching and you never so much as lifted a hand against me. What you have in fact done is confirm the prophetic writings. And all the disciples cut and ran. A young man was following along and all he had on was a bed sheet. Some of the men grabbed him, but he got away running off naked, leaving them holding the sheet. Then they led Jesus to the chief priest where the high priest, the religious leaders and scholars had gathered together. Peter followed at a distance until they got to the chief priest's courtyard where he mingled with the servants and warmed himself at the fire. The high priest conspiring with the Jewish council looked high and low for evidence against Jesus. They found nothing. Plenty of people were willing to bring false charges, but nothing added up, and they ended up canceling each other out. And then a few of them stood up and lied. We heard him say, I'm going to tear down the temple and build it by hard labor in three days, build another one without lifting a hand. Even they couldn't agree exactly what he'd said. In the middle of this, the chief priest stood up and asked Jesus, what do you have to say for this accusation? Jesus was silent and he said nothing. The chief priest tried again, this time asking, are you the Messiah, the Son of God? And Jesus said, yes, I am, and you'll see it yourself. The Son of Man, seated at the right hand of the Mighty One, arriving on the clouds of heaven. 
There was a man walking by, coming from work, Simon of Serene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, and they made him carry Jesus' cross. The soldiers brought Jesus to Golgotha, meaning Skull Hill, and they offered him a mild painkiller, wine mixed with myrrh, but he wouldn't take it. And they nailed him to the cross. They divided up his clothes and threw dice to see who would get them. They nailed him up at nine o'clock in the morning. The charge against him, the king of the Jews was printed on a poster. Along with him, they crucified two criminals, one on his right and one on his left. People passing along the road jeered, shaking their heads in mock lament. You bragged that you could tear down the temple and then rebuild it in three days. So show us your stuff. Save yourself. If you're really God's son, come down from the cross. The high priests, along with the religion scholars, were right there mixing it up with the rest and having a great time poking fun at him. He saved others, but he can't save himself. Messiah, is he? King of Israel. Then let him come down from the cross. We're all believers then. And even men crucified alongside him joined in the mockery. At noon, the sky became extremely dark. The darkness lasted about three hours. At three o'clock, Jesus groaned out in adepts, crying loudly, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders who heard him said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. Someone ran off, soaked a sponge in sour wine, put it on a stick and gave it to him to drink, saying, let's see if Elijah comes to take him down. But Jesus cried with a loud voice, gave his last breath, and at that moment, the temple went, was ripped down the middle. When the Roman captain standing guard in front of him said that he'd quit breathing, he said, this man has to be the Son of God. There were women watching from a distance. Among them, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of the younger James, and Joseph and Salome. When Jesus was in Galilee, these women followed and served him and had come up from Jerusalem. And late in the afternoon, since it was the day of preparation, that is the Sabbath evening, Joseph of Arimathea, a highly respected member of the Jewish council came. He was one who lived expectantly on the lookout for the kingdom of God. Working up his courage, he went to Pilate and asked for Jesus' body. Pilate questioned whether he could be dead that soon and called for the captain to verify that he was really dead. And assured by the captain, he gave Joseph the corpse. Having already purchased a linen shroud, Joseph took him down, wrapped him in the shroud, placed him in the tomb that had been cut in the rock and rolled a large stone across the opening. Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph watched the burial. And on the night of that last dinner, he took the bread. He said, this is my body that is broken for you. And in the same manner, he took the cup. He said, this is my blood that is shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for these holy moments of remembrance. Moments that have caused us to reflect upon who we are and who you are in your love toward this world. 
Lord, as we enter this week of Holy Week, may we carry these thoughts every day as we look forward to the victory next Sunday morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.